everyone and welcome to Meerkat Maths. I'm Katie. And I'm Miriam and we're two final year maths students at the University of Bath. In this video we're going to be talking to you about a little bit of the maths behind the card game Double and how to make your own set. So if you haven't heard of the game, it's a card game with 55 cards and on every card there are eight different symbols and between any two cards you pick up there's always a matching symbol. So in this case it would be the moon and normally you race to find the matching symbol first before anyone else. So to tell you a little bit about the history, in 1850, Reverend Thomas Kirkman submitted a puzzle to a journal about arranging 15 schoolgirls in lines of three each day so that they are never next to the same person. This became Kirkman's schoolgirl problem, which in 1976, Jack Cottrell was inspired by and generalised the problem. He created the game of insects, which included 31 cards with six images of insects and exactly one image shared between each of them. So that sounds really like double. Exactly. So this was found by Double co-inventor Dennis Blanchard and released as Double in 2009. So now we're going to talk about a little bit of the maths and then making our own game. OK, so if we're going to make a double set ourselves, the first thing that we need to work out is we need to work out the properties that make up a double set. And to work out these properties, we need to answer a few questions. We need to find out how many symbols there are in a double deck, how many cards there are, and are there a maximum number of cards. We also want to generalise this problem so we can make smaller double decks and larger double decks. And so in order to do this, we really want to break this down. And what we're going to do is we're going to make the smallest possible double set that we can. And this is a double set of three cards <laughs> and it has three cards and it has two symbols on every card and you start to build it kind of the process of elimination so let's let's say we're gonna have we're gonna have two symbols on here we're gonna have a sun and a heart so if we want to match it let's say we want to match it we want this card to be matched with the heart so if we're gonna match it with the heart well we can't we can't just put another certain because that that would they'd be the, exactly the same card. So we're going to need another symbol. So let's do a smiley face. OK, so then our final card, we need it to match to both of these cards. So we need to do a certain. And then in order for it not to be the same as this, we need to put a smiley face. And this way, this is our smallest double set, because if you if you cover up this, we've got the suns are the matching card. If we cover up this, we have the love heart. And if we cover up this, we have the smiley face. Okay. And you kind of start to see this almost triangular property between them all. And this is exactly it. If we look at it like a, like a triangle, but now with every point to be a symbol and every line to be a card, we start to see how our double set is going to be formed. So this is a really small double set and we want to work up to having eight symbols on a card. So what if instead of two symbols on a card, let's go up, let's go up to three symbols on a card. And a diagram similar to the triangle to represent this would be something that looks similar to this. And let's add in the symbols again as our points and the lines as our cards and you start to see how a card would be formed. And what's interesting is the reason why we know this works is you can see that any two lines intersect at a unique point. And intersect just describes when lines cross over and share a point in common. And here, the points are our symbols. So any two lines share one symbol in common. And this structure has a name and it is called a Fano plane, and it was named after an Italian mathematician called Gino Fano. And actually, the Fano plane is part of a larger group of planes, something called finite projective planes. And the best way to think about this is if you think of a normal graph that you would draw, and you draw two parallel lines together they will never intersect. So like these on the screen, if you kept going to infinity, they would never intersect on a usual graph. Okay, so we're going to build this new space, which 
for parallel lines, we're going to say that when they tend to infinity, they intersect at infinity. So that means that any line, including parallel lines, will intersect at a point, which is really hard to wrap your head around if you think about it. But if you think about a train tracks and you think of a two parallel lines like your train tracks and as we look into the horizon they kind of look like they're going to intersect even though we know that if we kept going along but let's say the train track went on to infinity it looks like they're going to intersect and this is what we need the property of because that means that any two lines regardless of whether they're parallel they're going to intersect because we know parallel lines if they tend to infinity they'll intersect so this is the assumption that we need so that is projective planes and by calling it finite this just means that we can start and finish counting the number of points and lines that make up our projective plane in contrast, if it was infinite, we would never be able to stop counting the number of lines and points. So if we started, we would be counting forever. And the reason why we don't want an infinite number is because we don't have an infinite number of cards. So we want to be able to start and finish counting the number of double cards that we make. So when we, when we think about this, there's actually the finite projective plane, this property, is, follow, is as follows. Any two distinct lines will intersect at a unique point. So this was what we were discussing before with the um, Fano plane. So let's interchange lines with cards and points with symbols and we start to see how double and finite projective planes meet. So in addition to this property, there's actually a number of other rules that every finite projective plane needs to follow. And so to talk about this, we need to introduce a number n. And this is a whole number, and it's just a way of identifying which finite projective plane we are talking about. And this is usually called the order. So let's say we were given a whole number n. So we have a finite projective plane of order n. So some of these rules that this plane would need to follow are things like this. And so in order to relate this to double, what we need to do again is we need to change lines with cards, points with symbols, and we start to build our key double properties that are going to answer some of the questions that we were asking right at the beginning. So we now know that if we're given a whole number n, we know that every card must contain n plus one symbols. And actually, every symbol only lies on n plus one cards. So every symbol only appears n plus one times in a deck. And we also find out our total number of symbols and our total number of cards. So let's relate this back to our Fano plane example and why don't we try and work out what the n was there. So the Fano plane that we had, we now know that there's n plus one symbols on every card. Well if there's three symbols on this card, so if n plus one equals three, that must mean that n would be two. So this Fano plane has order n equals two. So the question is, what about the set of double that we can buy? So let's have a look. So we've got eight symbols on a card. And so we, we were saying that there are n plus one equals eight symbols. So that must mean that n equals seven. So our double set must be of order of seven. Okay, so then we, to find out how many symbols we need and to find out how many cards we need, well, we were told that it's n squared plus n plus one. So n squared plus n plus one, let's put in seven. So what is seven squared plus seven plus one? That is 49 plus seven plus one. And that is 57. And 57, so that must mean that we have 57 different symbols in our double set and 
57 different cards. However, the double set that you can buy in stores actually only has 55 cards. And this is an ongoing mystery why the double creators didn't print the 57 cards they could have. And you can actually work this out. So if you look at a double set that you have at home, you can find the two cards that you're missing. And this is because every single symbol, if you were making the 57 card deck, every single symbol should appear eight times throughout the deck. So you can find out which symbols don't occur eight times and then start to build this deck. So the last big question is, can n be any number? As in, can a finite projective plane or a double set exist for any order n? And the answer is no. So actually, what has been proven is that a finite projective plane exists if n is a power of a prime number. So a prime number is ones that are only divisible by itself and one, so two, three, five, seven, and so on. And a power of a prime number are just these prime numbers to the power of something. So for two, it would be two to the power of one, which is just two, two squared, which is two times two, and so on. And if we did that for all prime numbers, we would get a set such as this. So a double set or a finite projective plane exists for a power of a prime and it is thought that these are the only finite projective planes or double sets to exist. However, this is not for certain as this has not yet been proven. So we're touching on some really current maths that is still not yet been proven, which is really interesting. So. We've spoken a bit about the properties. We know how many symbols, we know why, and we've related it to finite projective planes. But now, how do we actually form these? As in, how do we know exactly what symbols to put on each card, and how do we make these 57 cards, or a smaller deck, or a larger deck? So Katie's gonna have a look and talk us through. So Miriam's shown us some of the maths behind double and why it always works, but let's see if we can make a set for ourselves. So firstly, we need to think about the number of symbols we need and the number of cards we need and how many symbols we want on each card. So we're gonna be talking about the order again, which we talked about before. Now remember, we want this always to be a power of a prime. So we can use this table to work through each order to find out how many symbols we want on each card and what our total number of symbols and total number of cards need to be. So from before, we remember that we want n plus one symbols on each card and each symbol to appear n plus one times in the deck. And we want n squared plus n plus one to be the total number of symbols and the total number of cards in the deck. So if we start with our order n being two, we know that n plus one is three. So we've got three symbols on each card and each symbol appearing three times in the deck. And we know n squared plus n plus one is gonna be seven. So we've got seven cards and seven symbols in total. When our order is n equals three, we've got four symbols on each card and each symbol appearing four times. And we've got 13 total symbols and 13 total cards. We can expand this down for the rest of the table. And if we see that bottom line where n equals seven is actually our double set because we have 57 cards. We're gonna show you which symbols need to go on which cards to make sure the game always works. So we're gonna use the n equals two order to show a slightly smaller example than the actual double set so that we can more easily work this out. So that means we're going to have seven symbols and seven cards in total. And this is actually like the Feno plane we saw earlier of order two. We're going to use this table to work this out for this smaller example. So we know from before that we wanted seven symbols and seven cards. So we've got the seven symbols across the top and the seven cards down the left hand side. So using our calculation from before, which was n squared plus n plus one, we know that this should be a seven by seven table. We're gonna use a one in the table to signify that that symbol needs to go on that card. So for example, if we have a one in this top left square, it means that we're gonna have our first symbol, the giraffe, on card number one. If there's a blank space in the table, it means that that symbol will not be on that card. 
We know from before that we need n plus one symbols on each card, which in this case is three. So we need three symbols on each card and each symbol should only appear in the deck three times. So that means every row is gonna add up to three with those ones and every column is also gonna add up to three. So this is how we're gonna methodically work through and fill out each card one by one. So we're gonna start with card number one, and because we know we want three symbols on this card, we're just gonna simply start by putting the first three symbols on the card. So that's the giraffe, the flower, and the ladybird are all gonna go on card number one. If we move on to card number two, we know that we want one symbol in common with card number one. So we're gonna start by putting symbol number one, which is our giraffe, onto card two and onto card three, so that, that is the symbol they have in common. So since we've got the giraffe on three cards, we know that that column is going to add up to three, and so we've put it on every card it needs to be on. Since card number one is full, we can look at card number two. So we want to move along to the next available slot that we can put a symbol on card number two. So if, for example, we were to put the flower on card number two, we can see that this is in common with card number one, but we've already got the giraffe as a symbol in common with card number one, so we can't put the flower on. So we move along to the first available slot and we put ones in these columns to signify that the next two symbols are going to go on card number two. Now we can work in the same way for card number three. So we move along to find the next available slot for where we can put a symbol onto card number three. So for example, if we put a one here to mean the B is going to go on card number three, we can see the B is in common with card number two, but we've already got the giraffe in common with card number two, so we can't put a one here. So we need to move along and put ones in the last two columns. Now card number three is full and complete. We can see we've completed the first three cards and we can see they've only got one symbol in common between each two of them. So this is a section of our Fano plane that we saw before. So these three lines make up the first three cards. We can continue with this method onto card number four and work through methodically to work out which symbols need to go on this card for the game to work. So for example, if we put a giraffe on this card, we see that that can't happen because the giraffe has already come up three times. So we move along to the next available symbol, which means we put the flower on card number four. We know the giraffe has been completely used up, but we can think of this as a method to think about the next few symbols for which cards they should fall on. So for example, the flower has only come up on card number one and card number four. So it needs to come up one more time. So we're also gonna place that on card number five. So if card number six also had the flower, that means it would come up four times in the deck, which can't happen. So the flower also can't be on cards six or seven. So instead, as the first symbol for cards six or seven, we're gonna move along to the next available slot and add the ladybird to those two cards. So we can see along the top and down the left-hand side that we've got this diagonal pattern, which is really interesting. So now we just need to fill in the bottom right section, which is a little bit more complicated. So we start again with card number four. Each time we need to look at which symbols the card, each card is going to have in common with any other card. Now we only want this ever to be one symbol each time, so we need to keep that in mind. We also want to remember that each row needs to have three ones and each column also needs to have three ones. So that each symbol only appears in the pack three times and each card only has three symbols on it. So we know that our first three symbols are completely used up, so we don't need to worry about these for the remaining cards. We only want to worry about the right-hand symbols that are left. So for card number four, we're going to take the first available slot. We're going to put a one here because this means we've only got one symbol in common with any other card and no other cards have those two symbols that card four has on already. If we move along to the B, we can see if we put a one here, then card four is going to have two symbols in common with card two, which can't happen. So again, we need to move on to the next slot. We find that the next place we can put a one where there's only going to be one symbol in common is under the bear. So card four is complete as it's got three symbols on and we can move on to the next card. For card number five, we repeat this process. So we're moving along each time to make sure each card only has one in common with card number five. So then we can fill in the spaces and put ones here. So we can add the lines for cards number four and five onto our Fano plane. Since each line represents a card, we can see by our color coding here that this is slowly building up the Fano plane, but we're still missing a couple of lines. We can continue with this method for card number six, showing these two spots where we need to put the ones, and then adding that to the Fano plane as well. So we're nearly there. 
So for the last card we need to do, card number seven, we can actually think of this in quite a clever way. So since we know that every symbol needs to be on three cards, we can look for which symbols are only on two cards so far and add them onto our card number seven. By adding up the ones for each column, we can see that these two columns are the only ones that only have two in their columns so far. So these are going to go on card number seven and we've completed our double set. Now we can see our phalo plane is complete and our order two set is complete with our seven cards and seven symbols. Now this table that we've created, we can actually add zeros in when we've got these gaps and we can call this a matrix. So this is a way of storing numbers often used in computers. So now we can think about how we would do this on a larger scale. Our double set is of order seven, so it has 57 cards. Now, if we were to do it through this method that we've just done, that would take us a very long time. So we've actually got some code that we've used to run this through the computer. This uses the exact same method that we have, but just does it a lot quicker for us. We've actually used this code to create a worksheet for you that you can find in the description box below. You simply need to draw a symbol in each box for all 57 in the key, and then the instructions below it will tell you which symbols you need to put on which cards to make the game always work. So as Miriam mentioned before, Double only has 55 cards, so you can make two less cards and the game will still work every time. Thanks so much for watching our video. We really hope you enjoyed it and hope you found it useful when making your own Double set. If you're interested in finding out more, we've left some links in the description for further reading. And please let us know how you got on making your set in the comments and give us any feedback.